this is a big message because it's about taking a comprehensive approach to essentially 20% of our population. And that's a number that's grown dramatically over the last few years in terms of all the Michiganders. To put it in context, by 2030, 25% of our population will be older Michiganders. So this is something that's critically important. It has been for years, but it's only going to increase in magnitude and importance and opportunity the way I view it. One of the most important things to look at when you stop and talk about aging in terms of older Michiganders and such, it's one thing that we all appreciate we're getting older, but how do you maintain a great quality of life? Life expectancy is getting longer and longer, but it's not just about living years, it's about having high quality years. And that's really what the focus of this message is about, about how to make sure we're appreciating, we're supporting, and we're allowing great access for older Michiganders to contribute. The way I view it is there's great opportunities to continue contributing. And I guess Mary Miller is an outstanding illustration of someone that keeps on giving back and wants to keep that philosophy going. So how do you do that? Well, this message is one of the longer messages I've probably ever given. That's why I have a few notes, because I want to recognize some of the great opportunities that are already going on. But to say, we can do this in many different areas. And that's also illustrated by this wonderful panel that represent a wide diversity of Michiganders from different areas. So let me get started. The first thing is about maintaining their independence. And you start with being healthy. Now, one of the things we really want to encourage is healthy Michigan in terms of opportunities. In terms of something I launched several years ago was the 4x4 four four program. Four behaviors and four measures to keep us healthy. Um, getting enough exercise, having proper diet, not smoking, having an annual physical, in terms of looking at results and how we can stay healthy. Um, I want to give a shout out to one organization that's been a good role model and leader, and that's Presbyterian Villages of Michigan. Uh, they've done a great job. Um, they actually have a village competition, an award out there for people that do great in terms of bringing people together through their system to compete, um, to show how healthy they can be. So those are the kind of opportunities we need to look at, is not just talking about care once you're in trouble in terms of acute care, but how do we do preventive care? How do we do wellness right? and really encourage that. One of the other tools that's a new tool we have available, that's going to be a growing tool, is the Health Endowment Fund. Um, it was started when we did the restructuring of Blue Cross, and now it's funded with $100 million, and there should be $100 million coming for the next decade or so, to get it over a billion dollars fund that will be looking at how to do innovative programs in healthcare, including young people and seniors, in terms of looking at new ideas. And I think that's something we should be proud of and gives us a great opportunity. Another area when you talk about health care is how do you support the caregivers? In many cases, there are family members that are the caregivers. Over, over a million Michiganders are caregivers, whether it be the seniors or young people. And how do you create an environment for success? One of the challenges for many caregivers is they're working. And so, in the message today, I really want to highlight, again, how the private sector is making a difference. So one group in particular I want to highlight was Mid-Michigan Mid Health of Midland. Um, they're a four-time award winner from the AARP for being a great place to work for people over 50. And a big part of that award, I believe, relates to their programs and their opportunities to allow um, workers there to be able to take time off, to have flexibility, to be a caregiver. And I would encourage many companies and organizations to say, how do you build on some of those standards and policies they have to allow better caregivers? Um, home and community-based services. This is one of the biggest ones. This is the ask where we have about a $20 million budget ask of the state legislature this year, when I talk about home and community-based services. This is what we're talking about making Michigan a no-weight state. Um, today in Michigan, we have people that are looking to get meals on wheels. We have people looking to get in-home services. We have the My Choice Waiver Program, where we have a waiting list. All situations where we don't have the full resources we need to really service people the way we'd like to. We have an opportunity to make Michigan a no-wait state for those in-home services. This is a really big deal, and I appreciate the broad coalition support we've had going. In fact, if you look around, you may know some people have a silver key on. Uh, there's the Silver Key Coalition, which is a group of organizations and people coming together to really send a statement we should be a no weight state, and I'm proud to have my silver key on now. So I believe that's a great opportunity for us to be successful. 
We can also be innovative, though, when you talk about in-home services. One group in particular I want to mention, a group called UCAP, working with the Community Action Agency up in the UP, they take Meals on Wheels to a level we should all aspire to. They'll deliver them by snowmobile. <laughs> and we should be proud of people being that innovative and creative on how to do things. Also on the health side is the whole issue of dementia. Um, it's a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of looking at the issue, we want to highlight the issue, but we also want to work on the issue. So June is actually Alzheimer and Brain Awareness Month. So if you go to the state website, you'll see we have purple banners on it to really highlight the issue that, in fact, we have too many people already in Michigan that need help. It's about 180,000 Michiganders, and we need to do more. One of the things we're trying to do is how can we support people as they go through this process in terms of keeping them alert, aware, giving them access to things. And I want to thank um, the Elder Heart Program at the Michigan Historical Museum, where literally they're bringing in groups of people and giving them exposure and having dialogue and discussion about what's going on in Michigan history. I think we have a lot of organizations in our state that can do similar programs, and we're going to encourage people to do that. Also, I want to thank the University Research Corridor. Michigan State, U of M, and Wayne State for the research they're doing with respect to dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, putting people ahead of programs, sort of shifting gears a little bit, now talking about people that may be in the nursing home system in some fashion. And we have some outstanding nursing homes in Michigan. But there's more work to be done. One of the things we can do is we don't have enough nursing homes that have people-centered programs. Um, they tend to be more traditional. And if you look at many of the things we're finding success in in the state are really encouraging people to move to more a people-centric model, treating the patient as one individual and how they can provide the best basket of services to them. It's only about 30% currently in the state of Michigan. So I'm encouraging our state departments to work together with Cary on coming up with performance-based incentives to change that dynamic, to change that percentage and have it grow dynamically so we can have much more patient-centered or person-centered care going on in our nursing homes. Another area that gets into the Department of um, Community Health in particular is something that Michigan's going to be a leader on, which is really the question of dual eligibles. These are people that are both under Medicaid and Medicare. Um, this is one of the most challenging groups in all of healthcare, has been for years. And we've never done a great job in this country of bringing those two systems together and having a partner again in a patient-centered model. Um, Michigan's been approved now to be one of the really pilot states to do this work. So I'm really proud of the fact that we're going to be in that category and we're going to have a number of pilot areas in 2015 across the state of Michigan. So thank you for that good work, that application, and how we're going to move ahead with that. Other areas. Veterans. Again, we have many seniors that are veterans, along with many other special groups. So one of the things I'm going to encourage is both the Department of Management and Budget to work with Harry's group in particular on a special website on how we can come up with specific web pages for groups within older Michiganders that we can focus in on, make sure they can have better service provision, better information, and how to get connected with the right services. Um, safety and security a critically important issue. And this is one, I have to tell you, I don't think we're doing the job we need to do in the state of Michigan for adult protective services. We've seen many more issues come up with adult protective services in terms of people asking for help, and we haven't been able to keep up the way we want to. I can tell you the department's focused in on addressing that in terms of getting on top of this, but this is something we're going to be proactive on, because we don't like to see issues, and we want to make sure people are getting the services they deserve and are taken care of. There's the whole area of elder abuse. I'm proud to say last year we passed a significant package of bills to help address elder abuse in the state of Michigan. So I want to thank my partners in the legislature for that good work. We're moving ahead. And one subset of that we need to do more work is the area of fraud. Far too much fraud goes in and on with our seniors in terms of being taken advantage of. And in some ways it's hurt by new technology. The emails people get, the other information people get that they never got before, is it's very easy to get a hold of seniors and try to get them confused or to get them in a negative situation. And so I've asked for additional budget resources, a million dollars to be set aside to give us a focused effort on elder abuse, particularly fraud. I'm going to stop for a minute and let you know this is not, this is something that can affect any of us, because this was actually a personal issue in my family. My mother years ago was staying at home. We managed to arrange home care for her. I was living off in South Dakota, 
and the caregiver came and basically took her checkbook and cast fraudulent checks. And it took us close to a year or so to find out about it and then to deal with the situation. That's the kind of abuse that shouldn't happen in our state. So we need to stay focused on how to prevent things like that from happening to others. Um, communities, going to the broader scale. We want age-friendly communities um, that are doing programs. And the great part is, is both the Office for Services on Aging has Communities for a Lifetime program. And then beyond that, AARP has come up with some good programs that are even more encompassing to encourage communities to look at being senior friendly. And we've got a great illustration. Auburn Hills has been an outstanding role model in Oakland County for a community that is one of our communities for a lifetime, but also working hard on getting approved or certified under the AARP program. So we want to thank communities that are doing that. We have several already, but I think we have a lot more. We have 23 communities for a lifetime today. Um, access to transportation and public transportation of how you get around. It was great. When I was getting the tour from Mary, I got to hear about a lot of great minibuses. That's how Mary got started driving a minibus back in the early 70s. But we can do more in terms of public transportation systems. And usually what we find is the problem is when they have to cross a line. Whether it goes from one city to another city, whether it goes from the city to the county, or it goes from county to county. Because quite often we know you need broader direction, more access to broader geographies. That's important for someone's lifestyle. And I want to give a shout out to a group that's showing how to do it right, a Thunder Bay Transportation Authority. They're actually operating in three different counties and helping provide service. So if they can provide service in Thunder Bay for three different counties, I think we should be able to figure out how to do that in southeastern Michigan, for example, in a better fashion. Um, talent, looking to the future, about how to engage seniors more and more. Um, there's two or three categories under talent. Now, when I talk about talent, I'm talking about the seniors themselves. Again, we shouldn't overlook that. We should be embracing and engaging seniors more. The first one is volunteerism. If you look at the volunteers in the state of Michigan, about a quarter of them are seniors. And they're doing tremendous work all across our state, but there's more that can be done. There's a program in Grand Rapids I was going to highlight. It's called the Grand Rapids Encore Initiative. And you sort of get the point when you hear the name, Encore. So these are geared for actually business professionals. These are people that have had a great business career and about bringing them back to re-engage them in the public sector, the private sector, or some organization where they can help them give back more. Um, we want to be a good role model, so we're going to look at seeing how we can do that Encore initiative actually in state government. So if we can bring back some of these outstanding executives to help with state of Michigan government. Because if it's good for everybody else, it should be good for us too. So we're going to try to engage in that. Um, the other one, though, is not just saying it's about volunteering, it's about still working. How do you keep working in terms of finding good opportunity? And I think we're going to see a great illustration. I'm going to say this one, but it's great to have Bosch with us because they're a good role model on how to engage people and keep people active in a working um, context. So I'll let Bob describe that, but it's great to have you here to represent that, Bob. Another one is, as I added this one, because I feel passionate about this, is entrepreneurship. Um, just because you're over 50, you're over 60, doesn't mean you can't be a great entrepreneur. And we need to encourage that. Uh, so one case, actually, I want to give you a whole case study on Wally Bloom. Um, it's a great story. Wally's from the Wayland area. And Wally built a very successful business. He was in the dairy industry for a lot of years. And then at age 61, he started Denali Flavors back in 2000. But the, Denali has now grown to be over a $100 million business. And isn't that a great success of someone at 61 going out to start a successful business? And this is something that you may care about personally. I didn't tell you the most important part for most of you about Denali Flavors. They're the people that had moose tracks. <laughs> <laughs> so see, you just thought it was a normal business. Now it's important that Wally started that business to most of you. Um, that's the kind of opportunity we should be encouraging more and more. So I'm going to ask the MEDC in particular to work with again, carry the area agencies on how we can do more entrepreneurship and startup companies. Now, one of the things I want to talk about, and this is, again, something that I thought would be good to clear the air, and this is about the reinvention of Michigan, is a topic that comes up quite often is the quote-unquote pension tax. And I want to be proactive to let people know it's not a pension tax. 
What we did was clean up our tax code. We eliminated exemptions, exclusions, ways people weren't paying tax. And one of those was for pension income. And why did we do that? It wasn't to cause issues with people, but it was unfair. The first thing we did, though, was we grandfathered everyone 67 and older. So anyone that was a senior 67 or older when we did this change had no change to their situation. None. In terms of the change for pension exemption. What we did was is to say, you shouldn't pay tax simply because you have a certain kind of retirement income. We are concerned about our seniors, so we said, let's change that and create a different exemption that is to cover seniors. So we took something that covered pension income, regardless of your age. If you retired in your 40s or 50s, it applied to you. Or if you had a very high income pension, um, it applied to you and you didn't pay any tax. So we replaced it with a senior exemption that's being phased in, but for people 67 and older, that if you make 20,000 as a single or 40,000, whether it's pension income or you're still working, that's excluded from Michigan income tax. It makes us the eighth most generous state in the nation. So we got rid of something that was fundamentally unfair in terms of high income people and people that were still working age but weren't paying tax where people that were seniors that were working were still paying that tax. Now we're making it fair for seniors, whether you're working or not, but if you have income, you can have an exclusion for that. If you're a couple over $40,000, you shouldn't pay any Michigan income tax. Under $40,000, excuse me. You shouldn't pay any Michigan income tax. That's a good deal compared to most states. So that's something that I wanted to just clear up with people because there's been so much misinformation about it. Um, one area that ties into this, though, that I really want to focus on, and it's great to have Peggy from the MACPA here, is retirement planning. One of my great concerns is I don't think we're doing enough to support our seniors um, with their financial affairs. Quite often it's easy to have a discussion with a senior about their health issues. But how often can you have a thoughtful discussion and an important discussion about their financial affairs? Um, I'm concerned that we have too many seniors out there that aren't prepared as much as they should to make sure their retirement is sustainable. So one of the things we really want to emphasize is how can we provide more services? Never tell people they have to do it, but provide more access and to look at some pilot programs on retirement planning for people that are seniors today or soon to be seniors. Actually, we should be taking this down to the young people getting out of school for these high school graduations and doing more retirement planning. But let's start that dialogue. Let's make more emphasis on it and let's make it something we focus in on. Um, lifelong learning. Now I have a couple more, so bear with me. Lifelong learning. Um, a lot of people never want to stop learning. I know that's my model. I never want to stop. And I want to compliment places that do a great focus on it. One that stands out is Pella Community College. They've actually done better than any other community college in our state about having seniors come back and get an education, whether it be in academic courses or enrichment courses. And we really want to encourage that. And then a last good one that I hope all our seniors take advantage of is Pure Michigan. Um, we're a great state for tourism, for an opportunity for recreation. Um, again, that's that volunteerism. And when I talk about tourism, it's more than just simply going to see things. It's being active, whether you're a hunter or a fisherman, and you want to get out there and experience Michigan. Um, we're, trying, we're working hard on becoming a trail state. So those of you trying to get all those steps in a day, see, I've got my Fitbit on. There's a way to get out there and walk and enjoy that. So let's, we're going to continue to emphasize pure Michigan in terms of an opportunity for our seniors. I've covered a lot of things. And quite often I've gone through them fairly quickly. All of them are important. These are all opportunities to help older Michiganders, our seniors, in terms of having a higher quality life within our state. I hope that resonates with all of you. I see, if I looked at the age profile, it does for a lot of us. Again, I qualified, remember when I walked in here. But all of us are going to be in this category at some point in our life. And the good part is we're living longer. But it's about how we have a higher quality lifetime. And so I went through probably a dozen or more things. There's not one answer to the situation. It's really how we bring a whole group of things together in concert, in collaboration, to really show how we can make a difference in people's lives. And that's why it's really important, folks. Many of these are things that 
we need your support from the public private sector collaboration model. We can't do these all by government. But let's partner together. Because isn't it great to stop and say we have the opportunity to help people that are our family members, our friends, us, and people all across Michigan that we can make a better life. So that's where I'm proud to give this message. And I hope we're all going to embrace it. Many of you will find different parts you embrace the most, but please embrace the entire message. Because it's how we can all work together to make Michigan a better place. With that, I'm going to go sit down and let's hear from some of these outstanding individuals because, again, in each way, they're going to show the opportunity and power that we can do with older Michiganders and how we can collaborate and work together to make this a better state. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, you outlined a great strategy for us to make Michigan a great place for aging and living. Um, now, to reinforce that message, I'd like to welcome Jacqueline Morrison to say a few words about the changing demographics in the state. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Governor. This is a historic day for those of us in aging. We're thrilled. And acknowledging the fact that our state is aging is important for you to do that. It's going to set the pace for us to uh, really embrace this age wave or the silver tsunami, whatever you call it. It's a huge social change. It's not something that's coming. We're in the middle of it right now. And it's having a tremendous impact on our families, our communities, and on our economy. As the governor said, by 2030, nearly one in four residents in our state will be 60 and older. And the fastest growing older group are those 85 and older. That's going to mean we'll have to make some changes, and, we, and we're making those under this plan. At AARP, we believe that no one's possibility should be limited by age. And what we're finding when we listen to and look at our membership is that our members are waking up to this shift. And they're realizing, oh my gosh, I've lived longer than I had planned for. I've outlived my money. I have to take care of my parents. They are really starting to reimagine their life. The, the cycle of life has changed from a curve that you, you know, you're born, you raise up, and you work, you retire, and you die. You're born, you're raised up. There's a little dip around 40, 50, but then it ascends, and it goes up. And so our life cycles are going to a new phase of life that we're all going through. And I'd like to share just a few of the things that ARP is doing to help address this new life phase. It's uncharted territory, folks. Number one, we are rallying policymakers and companies to act in the best interest of the 50 plus. As the governor mentioned, we do have an award for those companies that have the best workplaces for, for those 50 and older, and they're coming up with some very creative solutions. And older Michiganders, our members, they need to work, they want to work, yet age discrimination is still a reality. And we have to fight against that and make sure that we're creating opportunities for full and part-time work. In fact, many of them are, because they can't find work in the workplace, are starting new businesses, as the governor said. Those between 45 and 64 nationwide, they were over half of the new business startups in 2013. And we need to support that, um, that uh, development. The other thing that's really important for us to, to know is that Americans age 65 and older spend, spend 84 to 92 percent of their income. They spend locally on products and services, especially medical care. So our older population isn't a drain on us, it's rather an economic driver. And we need to, to look at that and look at the new products and services that we can generate to help make that uh, reality continue. Additionally, Social Security. Those dollars, every dollar paid into Social Security in Michigan, generates nearly $2 in spending by individuals, adding about $55 billion <coughs> to our total economy. That's really pretty amazing. But more than that, we are encouraging individuals to really um, work on their personal growth and development. What's happening in this life phase is requiring all of us to change. I thought I was fully grown at 60, but I'm finding I'm still growing and learning. And so through our program, Life Reimagined, we're helping people navigate that course. 
We're protecting the vulnerable among us, and all of us need to be concerned about that. Because while we're living and the life curve is going up, there are far too many who have life-threatening uh, challenges in the areas of housing, hunger, isolation, and income, as well as elder abuse and fraud. The solution, we think, lies in the local community and unleashing the energies of our local communities through age-friendly communities that create livable spaces for those 85 as well as those are eight. We can all be involved in that. We have to create livable age-friendly communities through volunteerism, through service, through innovation, and reimagination. And intergenerational activities are especially important. Thank you, Governor, for your work in this area. We're proud to work with you to help turn Michigan into the best place to live and lead with dignity and purpose. Now I'd like to introduce Keith Morris, who's going to touch on something that's near and dear to all of us, and that is the importance of preventing elder abuse and exploitation. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Keith Morris, and I started at Elder Law about 15 years ago as a law student. And over the entire 15 years, I keep seeing more and more issues of elder abuse. The first thing, when people call our legal hotline for Michigan seniors, they don't call and say, I'm a victim of elder abuse. They call with other related issues. And it's our job to try to help identify you know, some of the underlying causes. And I'm so happy to hear that there's been an emphasis put on elder abuse. Thank you, Governor, for, for the, um, the $1 million you have in your proposed budget. I'm so excited to, to see the things that are going forward with that. I know um, Carrie and the folks at OSA have some wonderful things planned to do with that. I'm excited about a, you know, their possibility of a new reporting system that will allow us to know exactly what's going on with elder abuse. Because elder abuse touches every person in this room, whether you realize it or not. One, because we're all going to be an elder at some point. And two, there's probably someone in your life that's a victim of it, but may be ashamed to tell you about it. And so part of what we have to do is educate the public about what elder abuse really is, and that it's not a shameful thing to be, you know, to admit that I've been a victim of elder abuse. The other part is we have to educate the providers, folks like you and me that, that meet with seniors every day. We have to educate them not only on what we're doing, but what other people in the community are doing. And so I'm so excited to hear the efforts that are going on at the state level to coordinate services better, to educate the providers about the other options that are available out there. And I think, it, you know, because as a provider myself, I want to know every possible resource that I can give, you know, give my client. And having that type of um, vehicle available for us will be a wonderful thing for us to do. Um, you know, the other thing, along with that, is some coordinated training putting training together so that, you know, I know law, but I don't know social services, but I should probably do a better job of doing it. And I think that, that using, you know, the funds that are dedicated, the dedicated folks that are here today to put, you know, some type of training together so we can share our information will go a long way to helping us do a better job of meeting the needs of seniors. You know, the Michigan State Police reported, I believe, 35,000 cases of elder abuse, financial exploitation. That's 15% of all the ones they had reported. And you and I both know that's way underreported to begin with. So we need to take you know, every effort that we can and recognize that one, we're going to be an elder one day, and two, someone in our life is, a, you know, is probably a victim of it, and we need to do everything we can to support them. Thank you very much. The governor talked a bit about making Michigan an away state for in-home services and to speak of her experience as a volunteer in one of the most well-known um, in-home services, that's Meals on Wheels, I'd like to introduce Marge Petch to share her experience as a Meals on Wheels volunteer. Well, good morning, um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, it's been a long time since I've done public speaking. Um, <laughs> I've been a volunteer here for, at OPC for many years and um, enjoy every minute of it. I work at the information desk selling at Arts and Apples, selling, making pies, and a lot of other um, jobs. But the most rewarding is delivering meals on wheels. Uh, my daughter got me started at it. Um, she was a coordinator for one of the local grade schools, needed someone. An emergency, so mom did it. Been hooked ever since. It's a wonderful experience. I've got 
Um, I've taken my husband with me and my grandsons and uh, the seniors. They love to see the young people there. Um, what a great program. It not only provides a nutritious and well-balanced meal for the homebound. Volunteers are there with happy, smiling faces. Um, sometimes these seniors, we are the only people that they see all day long or speak to. Um, not only do we bring the food, we bring flowers, we bring um, little projects that school-gage kids have made in their classrooms. We also bring uh, a birthday cake on their birthdays, which the seniors appreciate. There was one lady, though, um, a tear in her eye as we approached with the cake. Um, she had forgotten it was her birthday. But you could tell she was happy someone had remembered. Um, we also do a very quick visual health check just to make sure they're dressed, if they, they're feeling pretty good. Um, I am happy that the governor is doing everything possible to keep our senior programs well funded. These programs help our seniors uh, stay in their homes and maintain some kind of uh, independence. I am proud to be able to volunteer um, this work. It gives me a chance to give back to the community and help others. I'm um, also thankful <coughs> there are people like the governor who are working so hard um, so these seniors have access to these wonderful programs. Um, I do have a short letter here from a lady who is very thankful um, from the help that she received at OPC. Thank you, OPC Meals on Wheels, for being there when I so needed you. Blessings to your volunteer drivers who delivered them with smiles and good wishes. Many, many kudos to the people who cooked and prepared our meals. They were delicious. Even though my appetite was poor, I ate every one in many days. That was my main meal for the day. Um, I am well now on my feet. I just want you to know that this is the bridge that helped me get there. Much appreciation. And her name is Mary, but spelled with a Y. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, thank you Marge, for making a difference to so many people. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Bob Cummings. He's going to share some of his experience at BASH and what that organization has done to embrace our older workers. Appreciate uh, having the opportunity to be here uh, this morning. Uh, many times uh, when I would, in the past, uh, talk about Bosch, people would look at me and say, you work for the eyeglass company, Bosch and Long. I said, no, 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 it's a different company. Uh, many people don't know much about it, but it's about 120 years old. It's a self-funding company. It's the largest, if not the largest, privately held company in the world. 92% uh, of it is owned by a charitable foundation. So most of the money either goes back into the company or goes to the charitable uh, foundation for their uh, activity. We got about 280, 90,000 employees worldwide, 62 billion in sales. So it's a large company. It works, uh, we're in the automotive sector. We're the largest automotive supplier in the world. Uh, we're in the industrial, we're in energy and building technology and consumer uh, products. So it gives you a little bit of the background of the company. About 2000, uh, uh, someone in Germany, our headquarters is in Stuttgart, Germany, came up with the idea that, you know, we're, we're growing rapidly, we have a lot of things going on, and we just don't have enough of expertise in-house to handle the growth that we're going through. So somebody came up with the idea, well, let's go out and bring back our senior executives. So they started this program, a decision was made to start a program of bringing back senior executives within the Bosch group to help out with this rapid growth that they were going through. And over the years, it became very successful, but their focus over there was on senior executives, uh, retirement there in Germany for senior executives at age 60, so you had a little bit younger crowd there. And about five years later, in 2005, I got a phone call uh, here in Detroit and asking me 
Well, Bob, why don't you start the same thing here in North America? And my response was, we, well, I, first of all, I thought, well, we've got a lot on our plates right now. I'm not sure I can handle this. But we don't have that number of senior executives here because we're a lot younger company here in North America. We just don't have that talent pool out there. But I came back and I said, look, if you allow us to open it up to all retirees, then it might make sense because we had a, a rapid growing retiree base at that time. So back in 2005, we started a program where any retiree uh, could raise their hand and say, hey, look, I would like to work for Bosch on assignments as they come up. Uh, please let me know. So we started this process. It actually was a little bit difficult to get going because uh, the devil is in the detail. When you start talking about U.S. labor law, and you start talking about administrative services, ERISA law, and so forth. It became a little complicated, but we worked our way through it. Um, today, uh, we have now about 650 uh, employees in our database. Uh, we have at any one time about 150 employees that are on the site. In fact, the, the program became so successful, we opened it up to not just retirees, but any employee who had left the company on good standing uh, could participate in this program. So it's a program where uh, it, uh, retirees uh, proactively say, hey, look, well, I'm interested in an assignment when I retire. Uh, they fill out a simple form, it goes into our database, uh, and then when assignments come up, we can do a search thing internally and then um, contact the, uh, uh, the retiree we call consultants and uh, ask them if they're interested in taking an assignment. I'm a consultant. I'm retired. Uh, I continue to work for Bosch. Uh, I'm currently on a couple of assignments right now, actually. Um, the program is run by retirees. Bosch Management Services is run by uh, a retiree group. Um, it's connected into our, uh, all of our data systems and so forth. And I remember, you know, one thing, uh, and I would say this to any company, when this issue first came up, um, there was a lot of resistance to doing this. Because uh, a lot of companies will hire people back that maybe had worked in their department or maybe their business unit. But when you start crossing over to different areas and businesses, a manager would say, well, they don't know anything about my business. Why would I want them? I'll just go out and hire an engineer from a consulting company outside. But over time, what they found out was, and this took years to build this up with, that it doesn't actually work that way. Um, first of all, you have, you have loyal employees that have worked for the company, so you know who they are. They have an interest in the company. You have employees who understand the culture of the company. And when you put those two things together, that's a, a powerful thing. When you talk about bringing somebody in from the outside and integrating them in on an assignment, and our typical assignments run about 45 days. So they, they look at it and say, okay, fine, I don't have to bring them up to speed, I don't have to talk about the culture, I don't have to talk about the lingo, I don't have to talk about the systems. Our manufacturing uh, processes are the same worldwide in any business unit, division, industrial group that you go to. I remember having a, a, a discussion, maybe a little bit of an argument one time with a manager uh, uh, in automotive who builds small little motors for wiper systems. And I had a candidate who was a power tools engineer who worked on motors and, and drills. And I said to him, I said, well, isn't that the same thing? And I just thought about, okay, fine, we'll give him a shot. And, uh, you know, it works out quite well because the, the Transfer of skills within the company is much greater than people think. So, um, I can talk about this subject to the cows come home. It's, it's something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, but I'd be glad to stick around afterwards if anybody had any questions or whatever. But it's extremely successful. We have it in Germany, we have it in the US, we have it in India, we have it in England. Uh, I'm working now with uh, uh, setting it up in Mexico, and uh, we'll be setting it up in China next, the same type of internal consulting. With our public. Thank you very much. Great. And finally, um, we have Peggy Dzoski, and she is going to talk about the importance of retirement planning. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for being here. It shows just how important this is to all of you. And I know it is to the governor. I was already asked to serve on a committee, a real committee already working on this, asking CPAs to get involved and share some of their expertise. And some of that is in retirement planning, getting ready, what, what you should know about, 
what you should look at. The main thing is, are there things out there that you can use and resources? In working with my parents, the one thing I did was had the opportunity to work with an inventory control list. Something that we have available, and we'll be working with the governor's team to share that on the website, but something that helps you put everything in place. Even if you have passwords that your family doesn't know, or things you need to get at right away. You know, when, when I sat back and said, hey, Dad, where are we at on this? He says, oh, I've got this over here in this file, and that shoebox up in the corner, that's got all the receipts, and it's like, really? How, how would I ever know where everything's at? We put together that inventory control. By the end of that, my dad sat back and said, boy, I feel good. That cloud is gone. I'm going to really go out, and I'm going to go to KSC. It was that fast. <laughs> it was that fast. But boy, did I feel good. And did I know it was time to get out and help other people? And so the Michigan Association of CPAs works very hard to come up with different ways to help. Estate planning, making sure that your kids know what's going on, your family members know what's going on. The one thing is, is that everybody wants seniors to have a long, happy life. One they can enjoy, they've earned it. They, they want those golden years, but they want to have freedom. And you know, you're younger now. Everybody's younger than our, our parents or their parents. We want to have more fun. We're living longer, costs more money, but there's guides to follow so that you know what you can spend. You know about the budgeting, and that's where CPAs can really make a difference. I will tell you, I was pleased to be on that committee, and I look forward to, to many resources, a toolkit that you'll be able to, to really understand and, and use and talk about being in paper, also in, in using technology. But we also know that sometimes you need both, and they're, they're thinking about everything, so it's great. And I can't thank the governor. One, we're so proud, one, because he is a CPA, we think. That makes a difference. <laughs> I have to tell you, that makes a difference because he understands budgeting. He understands financials. He understands how important it is, how somebody today could be doing really well, but with poor planning could lose their house. And we don't want that. We just don't want that. So he's pulled people together to give the best and provide the best for Michiganders to live a happy life. So, Governor, I thank you for that, and thank you for being here today. inspiring message from our governor, we've heard from our panelists, and now it's time for you all in the audience to uh, have a few minutes to ask a couple of questions. So there are two people that have mics, if you would want to, three people who have mics, okay, if you want to raise your hand. We've got a lot of folks here with a mic that want to ask some questions, and I see a question here in the front. Purple. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Palmetto. I'm the advocacy manager at the AAA-1B. Uh, we want to thank you so much for your leadership in making Michigan a no-wait state for seniors, particularly in home and community services. My question to you, the budget still remains in limbo at this point, so what can we as advocates do to really make a final push to help ensure that seniors are protected in your 2015 budget? Well, I appreciate that. I'm always glad to hear people want to help. Um, in terms of the budget process, I think we're looking reasonably good on this particular area, but we shouldn't take it for granted. In fact, tomorrow we're having older, Mich older Michiganders that are coming up to Lansing. Um, a number of the Silver Key Coalition people will be working at the Capitol building to communicate this as an issue. So I think if you have an interest, you might want to talk to Carrie right afterwards because we're happy to have uh, more people join in because tomorrow could be a big day to spread that message. They'll be out. Yeah. 10 out on the lawn, we'll be talking about this issue, so good timing, thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, let's see, other questions? Oh, right here, in the, right here in the third row here. Uh, my name's Lucy Strand, and I'm a member of the Older Persons Governing Board, and I'd like very much to uh, introduce the mayor of the city of Rochester, who I represent, Mayor Jeff Cuthbertson. Oh, hello. I'd just like to thank everyone for coming today and the governor for uh, bringing this message uh, to Rochester. We, we think with the collaboration between Rochester, Rochester Hills, and Oakland Township, uh, this really does show it can happen when we work together. So, so thanks very much. 
And while we're introducing folks, could you pass the oh, wait? Could you pass the microphone to the person right next to him? I'd like to introduce our um, Oakland County Board of Commissioner, and I think you also represent this area as well. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you. Yes, uh, Jeff Mattis, uh, Oakland County Commissioner. I want to thank the governor, all the panelists, Mary Miller. Uh, we've known for years the OPC was just a shining gem in our community. And we're just so proud of all of you here today uh, to recognize that and the governor positions you've taken for seniors. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, other questions? Oh, we got one here with Mary Miller in the front. Uh oh, look out. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I really do appreciate you coming today, and I appreciate Carrie inviting you here. I tried to get her down here, and then she brought the governor with her. So I <laughs> but I will tell you, the, the one thing that I'm really interested in is preventive health care. And I know tomorrow we have a big program in Lansing about health care, but it's all about getting money to people that are sick. I think we need to stop and look at places like Michigan Senior Olympics that keeps thousands of Michiganders active in sports and sends them on to the national uh, senior games, which is awesome. But we have not funded it the last three years. And I know there's been a funding problem in Michigan, which I, because we had gotten $1,000 for about uh, three or four years under the other two governors. So I hope this governor <laughs> looks at that again and looks at preventive health care so that we don't have to put so much money in uh, care for the elderly after they get sick because I think if we keep them healthy longer, it would be cost effective. Thank you. volunteer for it. It's an amazing event. And Mary, there is some stuff on wellness in the platform tomorrow as well. So we'll be sure to be highlighting that. Okay, other questions? Okay, yeah. Oh, great. Um, go ahead, Paul. Thank you. Um, good morning. And to the governor, I'm Paul Bridgewater with the President CEO of the Detroit Area Agency on Aging. I just want to give us accolade for waving in on the pensions for the city of Detroit with the grand plan. Certainly, uh, I, I think you took a step and certainly hopefully the legislature will go along with your initiative because again, it shows us that you're looking out for the pension of the retirees for the city of Detroit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So when you go to Lansing tomorrow, make sure you stop and tell your senator that same thing. <laughs> Okay, we have time for one more question, and we have one more here. Barry Carter with the Michigan Association for Home Care. And, and Governor, we really appreciate the message that you've delivered here today. Uh, the Michigan Association for Home Care is a proud member of this Silver Key Coalition, so we're very appreciative. Um, it was interesting that you shared the experience of, of your mother uh, and the fraud that occurred with uh, in-home services. and. Uh, just a suggestion that uh, take a look at the at licensing for, for home care services. You've been um, uh, rightly so very very uh, particular about any new licensing here in, in the state of Michigan, but it is one that would uh, certainly protect the public health and Senate Bill 71 is, is uh, worthy of consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are coming to the end of our time together here this morning. I'd like to thank everybody who's here today for your attention. Thank all of our uh, speakers who are here. And Governor, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you and your team for developing this very special message on aging. We look forward to working with you to make this vision a reality. And would you please come up and share some of your closing remarks, please? Well, thank you, Tina. I'll be brief. Um, I just want to mention a couple things. First of all, as you know, when we do things, it's important that you measure success, not that you measure failure. So one of the things I hope you'll have an opportunity to take a look at is over here on the right, to your right, you'll see a dashboard. So everything we do is we try to come up with external dashboards and internal scorecards to make sure we're measuring 
um, and tracking their success. So there's a dashboard with respect to this message. So I hope you have the opportunity to look at that. That's something we can watch progress happen on. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is really ask that we give a big shout out to all our panel members and to Tina and the OPC for all the hard work putting this together. Because your comments were very helpful and insightful. And this is the kind of involvement we need. We have membership organizations, um, the private sector, volunteers here, different groups working hard on making Michigan better with respect to seniors. So let's give them a shout out for helping us. And the last thing I have, I'd be remiss, um, is Mary's actually retiring. And I know she's not going to fully retire. I expect her to be creating a new company, probably, um, <laughs> given that entrepreneurial spirit that she's shown in this area. So I would like to ask Mary to come up, though. I have a proclamation to give to you. To... <laughs> well, you're a role model, Mary. So we actually love that. So if you come on up, I'd like to present a special tribute to you.